the world more than we can desire to explore. The world maybe is one of us for the world of the world. Oh, the interesting thing about this was that when the company, the company when all, all the companies closed down into the uh, December 31st, 1998, they cut the power, they cut the electricity, the water, everything. And for the next two smoking, years, while die, they went they through, you know, selling the facility and everything else, uh, it's, you know, literally, you can see the world. Yeah, there was no one there in the facility. And then in 2001, they, they, first. we were talking to the city and we said, we think there's a rock. We do a space museum and a space so museum. And, see and see after two years, the city said, fine. You guys go uh, in get cured, and dig through whatever you want in the whole plant. Just the fear if you think there's anything it's worth it's saving, because you can do it for us. And, and we're like, what? what I like <laughs> said, yeah, we're not turning the power on for you. Darker project. We uh, recommend you get some hard hats, and you have to spy on flashlights. Motivation. And so all of a sudden, we ended up doing inventing space archaeology. And it turns out that a lot of this had to be done and other places too, because you know, Grumman had abandoned the facility that built the lunar module, and other companies had abandoned their clients too. Most of them got paved over right away. In California, there was once a very aerospace industry. Most of those were destroyed. Um, so we were given a unique thing by the state and city. Well, they said we could go in and find whatever we wanted. This is the child. Within the five minutes of entering the plant, we were just walking through. And someone said, so No, no. Within I mean, five minutes of, of looking around, we found a shuttle tile. In a hall, we took it. Cool. So we started looking around. Um, we were given a, a grant by. Uh, Ken Winans, the Winans Foundation, the W Foundation. Winans is a guy that you hear on the radio in one of the financial companies, but he's also a Swiss collector, a Swiss historian. And he said, you know, if you guys are brave enough to go do this, and we had about a dozen volunteers, we went in. And he said, I'm going to buy hard hats and collecting bags and everything else. And so we started going through the buildings. Um, it was kind of, it was more than just a little bizarre. I mean, it shouldn't have been. But, but a couple of us probably believed in ghosts too many times or something. And we got the, in, in here and started finding some very odd things. As we walked through the plants, so we talked about the good stuff, and we talked about the eerie stuff. As we walked through the facility, um, it was amazing because the plant had been abandoned two years, but other parts of the plant had been abandoned for 10 years, 20 years even, because there was no need for anything more than after the testing show, but they never got around to putting anything else in there. So we were literally walking around and we were like, we on and stuff. I mean, we allow, were allowed to go in buildings that were in the way in the back of the facility here, that used to be airplane hangers for uh, fighters. Uh, and we were allowed to go through and see if there's anything there. We found Apollo wiring harnesses. We found space shuttle rudders that were fully outfitted for doing testing. But after the testing, they rolled them out in the middle of the grass and left them there. Wheels and everything. We found all sorts of stuff. At one point, I, I, and we have this on video, is that we uh, were walking around and we said, well, we haven't been to that building. You hear me screaming, uh, we haven't been to that building over there. And so we're walking over this building, and the guy's got the camera running the whole time. As we get a little closer, I turn to one of the guys and I say, that's, that's kind of an odd building, isn't it? It's really tall, but it's kind of narrow. And as we get towards it, I finally say to one of the other guys, that's not a building. We get there and find that somebody broke in one of the shipping uh, pieces, and it was a shipping container. And inside it was one quarter of a space shuttle cargo bay. General Dynamics had sent it out in 1979 or 80 for stress testing here at the plant. But it was not flight qualified, so after its testing, it left it in the, wood, it left it in the shipping container in the middle of the woods. 
going and left it in an abandoned in place. Um, we took an off footage of it. We tried to find a home for it, and eventually the city ended up having to sell it as scrap. Because not even any museums could say, well, I want one quarter of a space shuttle cargo bay for an exhibit. So, you know, the things like that that we just had to let go. We found an Apollo service module shipping container that had been turned into an awning because it gets hot. And when the employees were outside of these facilities testing, it got real hot. So they took the shipping container, bolted it to the side of the building, put a couple of sticks on the end so it wouldn't fall over, and we're using it as an awning for coffee breaks and smokes. You know, um, it's still here. We're trying to find a home for it with uh, the Kansas Cosmosphere. But I mean, there was just little weird things like that that were just so fascinating to find out. Um, another interesting thing, but not everything. The interesting thing was we were going through um, the buildings, and we have, you know, we had in our team. One of the guys that was still at that point, an older guy, he was employed by Boeing, and he was uh, not, and he was a volunteer with us. And we, at one point, we started realizing, okay, we're going to go into this building. This used to be the Department of Defense building that was doing stuff for Rockwell. And I turned it to the guy and I said, Jerry, are you sure we can go in here? I mean, he said, oh. Our defense came through, cleared it out months ago, years ago. It's fine, we can go in there. We go in there, and the first thing I do is I look down and I see these covers saying Department of Defense, Project Team, da 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 da, with photos. And I'm like, uh, Jerry, I don't think we should be seeing this. And because he was with Boeing, he literally said, okay. Put it aside and come on Monday morning because it was okay. weekends when we were in here. He called his boss and said, "Guys, did you know what you left behind?" Well, the time it wasn't quite classified, but it was also probably not top secret either. But it was still confidential. And we found a lot of things like that. Um, when Boeing took over, all North American, North American Rockwell and Rockwell International. Science. Projects were to be thrown out. Now I said thrown out, not saved. That is the truth. That literally in the engineering department there were these little wheel, four wheel barrels that were turned on their side and turned into uh, trash containers. Where literally you'd go by a guy's desk and he empties everything in his desk into the trash container and it's rolled down to the garage. The problem was that they got these things going that became too heavy and too awkward and couldn't be gotten back to the crane to lift it outside. So they were left here and when we went into the engineering department, we found some great you know, old documents and stuff on regarding Apollo stages, rocket stages, S2 stages, stuff like that that was salvaged. And in there, because this, when we went in, it was like three months after the Columbia launch, which was really kind of odd for us. You know, I kept thinking any time now somebody from the National Wire was going to come out in front of us and say, look, that space shuttle mock-up. See, it's not the space shuttle mock-up. It's Columbia. It's secretly hit. You never know which means it goes viral in these days. So anyway, we were kind of looking through this some stuff, and we were waiting for all sorts of stuff. We walked into one building where they used to call relations. Everything had been cleared except for two shipping. Like, you can imagine this room, all of our desks, all the chairs gone. And right in the center of the room were two boxes. Just two boxes. Very cool. We walked up to the boxes and opened them up. A chill came up our spine. They were a box, they were a box cool. ship set of pieces that destroyed the Columbia. They were even marked Columbia. The thing was, they were from 1981, not, not 2001. They were used for uh, training and for uh, engineering testing. They weren't slated to go for flight, but it was the same pieces that failed on Columbia that killed the crew. 
we found these, and of course we didn't know that at the time. I mean, you know, the hairs on the back of our neck were just blowing up and all this weird about us. Um, stuff like that went on. Uh, later, as I said, we salvaged them. Uh, some of the documents, as I told you, we finding the, the plan. We had the Boy Scouts and the Civil Air Patrol cadets helping us, coming in on weekends, taking down areas where our old bodies would no longer be able to go, finding these old documents and saving me. And the kids were really great. We would put them away and put such. But Jerry, the old man that, as I said, worked at Dorothy at the time, found Jerry that seven of the documents were, would help the Columbia investigation. The actual real seven documents that we recovered, the real seven documents were lost in the Bowling archives. We found duplicates of the documents, and Bowling was so thankful because it helped in the accident investigation for the Columbia show. The and we just said these cadets dug them up the and it said today. like space shuttle uh, tile yeah. testing or blah 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 something like that and we found them. We found, you know, it's funny because I can tell you going through being an art space archaeology, people never go look on the top of files or on the bottom files because they're harder to reach. So when we would open a bottom filing cabinet, we would find stacks of photos of failed tiles on Apollo or, or not Apollo, but Shuttle mission to 234 or something else. I mean, literally a lot of stuff that we found that literally we turned into archives for here in, in the Coombe Downey site. Um, a lot of stuff like this that just had not been seen. And we got a lot of those. Now, I was telling you about some, I promised you guys some mysterious, weird stuff. Well, I was up in building one. Well and I walked up the dark stair. Right? Remember, remember, the whole site is dark. Even in the daytime, there's no electricity. You would be walking down, you'd hear water dripping. You'd, you'd walk into some of the rooms that, oops, the plumbing had failed. And literally, there was three or four feet of standing water. That used to be where Shuck, by the way, that used to be where the computer electronics lab was. You'd find all the sort of stuff. And there was some mysterious stuff. So we walked into one building. We, I was had the hard hat with the light on, I'm looking at, and I see that there's the artificial, you know, cubicle walls all over the place. And we walked through this one room, and you know, most of the cubicles looked like they really pulled their stuff down, moved to the next office, or pulled some stuff down, removed their chair, or something else. We walked into one room. And we're yeah, like, it uh, looked uh, like the guy uh, left for coffee. That, the coffee days. cup was full uh, on his desk, yeah. and nothing One else in the room had been touched. Oh, wow. the we walked in there, and I mean, literally, uh, started uh, looking at his stuff, because I'm like, we have did the here guy here die here, or did he just, this you know, did he pick up and leave and never come back? And it took us about six months, and Jerry tracked him down. Turned out that literally he was that. He was so fed up that he was being taken over in order to go to Seal Beach to leave his office. He literally said, I'm going to a new job or anything else. He just grabbed his briefcase, walked out, left the coffee cup, everything on the desk. Wow. That was weird. It was in this building. In this building. Um, but my favorite one is we were going through the halls, and I, I, it seems like a few things happened to me. I don't know why. Maybe because I got better related to you guys, but I'm going down in this dark. I've taken off from the rest of the group. At one point, I'm walking through the cube walls, and there's a bottle of Diet Pepsi and a bottle of Diet Coke. And if you've ever seen a bottle of those two, after two, maybe three or more years, just left. You suddenly wonder what happened to your what's happening on the inside of your tummy. Yeah, that's a little bizarre. That I, I'm kind of like I got to remember that that acid really does suck to your stomach. Okay, so I moved on. So I'm going up, taking off from the rest of everybody, and I come up and around a corner, and there's this cubicle, and there's this one single piece of paper in this dark building, sitting up there. And it's addressed to whom it may concern. So I look at this with a hard hat light. It says, in these hollow halls, 
once men built the first spaceship to ever leave Earth's uh, gravitational pull. And it went on and on. You know, get yourself obviously this was a guy that was really sad and he left it on the pool wall as he left the building for the last time. We saved it. Um, we didn't know what or who. What, we, what I did personally, because as I said it was my find, was I took the picture out, or I took the sheet out. We made about a dozen copies from the original sheet and I put the original back. And it's still on the upper floors yeah, of engineering, IRG, the owners of the plant now, Hilton, have blocked that off Orlando, as one of the first areas to be gone back in there yeah. uh, with the photographic equipment and with recovery equipment to actually save some of that stuff. Questions, comments? But we literally left that as a tribute to the ones that, that were here. Okay. But we have copies of it up in our Aerosmith no, Legacy Foundation office, right up on the wall, the, that sheet that we found. It's, it's, because it's, the guy literally said, in here was built the X-10, Navajo, Little Joe, Apollo, and the shuttle. The first vehicles, and we, the ones who built them, hope that in the future, you know, I, mean, I, I can't remember the exact words, I wish I could. I wish I thought of this an hour or two ago, and I would have dug it up out of my office. But literally, it's just not to make you fun, because you realize that this is people that love their job, left something behind of themselves when they left. Put by Jack and Warner, it was one of those things that just, it's, you just kind of wondered about. It's, it's funny about aerospace, but I'm, I'm 20 years out of it now, and, and or more. Um, and when we worked in the industry, especially if we, as we first got out of college, it was known that you were going to save your first six months' pay, probably live with your parents. Your parents were ex aerospace, so you know they got it. Because the program would go up, and you'd ride the pony for 18 months, and then the program would go down, and you knew you were going to be laid off for six months. Yeah. So you always had a year of pay in the bank because it was going to go up and down. So there was this, you know, you there was there was this. You always got a new gig. You always got a new project. There's always something coming up. And then there were those end of an era of times that you know, end of the Cold War, fall of the Berlin Wall. It all changed. It, it's very true, and I'll, I'll throw one other story at you. You know, ten days after, or ten days after the last Apollo flight uh -huh. came back to Earth was Christmas in 1972, and I walk in, and um, you know, I'd always got, I knew my family. I mean, you know, your uncle and your aunt, and everything, and I knew that he worked in air, airplanes or something. He worked at Douglas, uh -huh. so I walk in, and he has a Christmas present. I open up, and it's. McDonnell Douglas press guide and equipment to Apollo 17. I said, Uncle Joe, this, I mean, did you? He said, yeah, I worked on it. But I've known you my whole life. Why didn't, you know how much I love this space stuff since I was a kid. Why didn't you tell me about this? He said, because I didn't want you to ever get stuck. Yeah. It's the exact term. Yeah, it's the up and down. You, you never have a real life. You really never have a real life. People raise manager. families off of it. But you always, you know, you, you buy a house and you might be driving to El Segundo. You might be yeah. driving to Hawthorne. You might be driving to ASD. You might be driving an hour and a half a day. I mean, I he was, yeah, he was in Santa Monica having drive to Huntington to work on the Saturn S 4B program for a follow -up. Excuse me, I'm going to turn this off, I think. This would happen. You, you, might, you might want to take the call because you never know. It might be somebody watching you. Actually, no, that's what I want to talk to. You. <laughs> okay. um, so, I asked him, I said, what, what is this? He said, I know how much you love this stuff, okay. but the sacrifices I had that I, I made, and I didn't, wasn't there for my three kids, your, your cousins, the stuff that I missed from my family and everything else, I really didn't want you to ever have to go through that. The divorce rate and, was like 40%. Yeah. It, 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 Two and a half times what it would have been because you okay. you just had to do what you had to do. You had a hard deadline. If I meant you spent a week at the plant, you spent a week at the plant. Well, it's funny when I worked with Tom Hanks and I was asked to do a cameo on From the Earth to the Moon, the Apollo Nine episode called yeah. Spider. Uh -huh. I was supposed to play an aerospace engineer, mm -hmm. and um, I went and did this stuff. But at the time I'm doing it, remember what my uncle said: not with the sacrifices he made. About. And so when the show finally came on, uh, my, my uncle was dying at that point. But I called him and his, and my aunt and I said, I'm doing this thinking of you guys. I did this 
you know, and I was kind of trying to portend and show what you did. And uh, my uncle would stop talking about that a few months away from dying. But the thing was that I got, I told him he finally saw the episode and he saw me on there and he cried. Mm. He was crying because of pride. Well, a couple of stories. I'm going to show you some ghost stories there. And I'm there is something. Now, as I said, the planet's all dark. We're walking through. Um, I go up the stairway to what used to be Harrison Storms, Stormy Storms' office. And we're going up the stairs and I walk in. And this is, you know, this is the executive vice president's office. Highest in the way. Lee Atwood did it for a while. Storms was there. And, and a while. And we literally walked around. And it was an executive bathroom, shower, bedroom, everything else. We're like looking at all the stuff. As I walked through there, I, I noted at one point, there's a somebody's, uh, what do you call it, a uh, shower, uh, bathroom? bathroom? What? A shit bathroom. Bathroom, bathroom. bathroom. For a better word, bathroom. Bathroom. Mm -hmm. uh, we all laughed for that, so we left them behind the bathroom. And as I said, I was alone in that room with a few you know, other people, but I knew everyone was there. And we're looking around, just kind of noting what the office is. And it's still some place that, that it, it's been walled up for uh, historical considerations when they finally do close down the side, they want to make that part of the museum. Um, but as I'm walking out, a few, you know, about 5, 10, 20 minutes later, wasn't very long, I looked over, the bathroom was gone. That was a little weird. <laughs> so I don't know what happened. Uh, I wouldn't have touched that bathrobe, but you know, something else might have. But you know, it's one of those things. Um, as you walk around here, the tops of the buildings, the World War II. Oh, yes, you have a question? Yeah. Did you find any models or anything that uh, you took from the trash or whatever? Oh, uh, well, we'll get around to that in a minute. Well, you know, as we walk onto the buildings and, and if through some of the buildings you walk through, you look up and you can see that the World War II camouflage, especially the paint, is still on the glass. And so the, the anti-aircraft batteries, the guns were taken down, but the batteries never worked. So some of the, the actual, you know, fixtures to the artillery are still up there. Um, just to note, webcasts are still running. I don't know if this was a scheduled session or not. So, as you guys are talking, it was. mics are stopped. Okay, mics are live, cameras are live. Okay, I know. Um, the other thing, I guess, the lady, what the lady was asking about is that, yeah, there was uh, some law things that we found here. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I did was I was looking around to see if there were any models, mm -hmm. anything historical. The city of Downey now has most of our archives, and I mean most of that because a lot of the stuff they're like, what are we going to do with this? <laughs> so they donated or got rid of or a lot of other things. Um, but when the plant was still closing, uh, one of the stories I've told before is the fact that the models um, were going to be all tossed. And the head of public affairs literally lost his staff from going and had nobody to clear out public relations files. So, uh, so I was there. Help pull out a few things. What they didn't give to museums, what were more damaged beyond repair, they ended up coming to my house. And they're actually here in the museum in some places, and uh, they're, you know, here at the site still. Uh, my favorite story is this was in '95 when they started cleaning up some of the facilities. I'm looking around, and I'm helping the guy pull some out. And I said to the guy, Al, I said, Al, what's this? It's covered in like three or four inches of dust. And we look at it, because he didn't know, and it says to the employees of North American Rockwell, with thanks for saving our lives, the crew of Apollo 13. And it was a piece of the strut of Apollo 13. Now this is four months before the movie came out. Now I had been involved with the movie, then they weren't. So I said, how are you going to do this? He said, I don't know, I think we're going to probably send it back to the Smithsonian and they'll, they'll put it out in the Smithsonian for sale. All right. And I said, well, Al, you know, I'm doing some exhibits downtown at the Museum of Science and Industry and the such. I could use this. He said, you know, I'll sign it off to you at the end of the day. And so I have in my collection this strut 
from Apollo 13 that went around the moon and came back. And when the site closed and everything else, it was still part of some of the exhibits and such I used, and I personally took care of. And I've always said, as far as I'm concerned, it's sitting in the ALF building. And there's, and there's also another piece of Apollo 13 in the building here mm -hmm. that literally, this, it was given to the employees here, it's going to always belong here. So, you know, that kind of thing. But there was that kind of stuff digging up. I got the, the prototype model of the Ravel Apollo spacecraft. They sent it out in different colors of plastic to just, and Rockwell, and the, the, the note was, North America, did we do this model right? Tell us what's wrong. So I know that and this is the model no one had sent it back with the corrections, before. by the way. So that's why the model was a block one model instead of an Apollo that like somebody bothered to send it, bothered to update it. That's beautiful. So it was in the storage room, and I got to keep that afterwards. Really you know, I kept the junk stuff. Point. People were like, "Well, this is junk," and I'm like, "No, I'm a model so builder. I know what that is. It I means something to me." Yeah. And a lot of my artifacts yeah. ended up being borrowed by Mr. Hanks for the from the Air to the Moon series. Mm -hmm. And I got to keep a lot of the artifacts after the show, astronaut and such like that. I do. Um, but we found a lot of interesting little things. Uh, we're about to have the uh, moon pioneering contest, so I'll just finish by saying that, yeah, while a lot of us haven't experienced space archaeology, it's something that is growing and will be. So if you have any questions, please fire did, it down. Did you tell the story about the Ampex tapes that they found from the, uh, from the uh, uh, original film, Moon Surveyor? Because they lost the Apollo series tapes. Right. But because of the stop loss, the stop loss is a... Uh, do this device, anything or anything that looks like it nationwide, do not throw away or destroy. So a stop loss is a, and it can be for legal purposes, it can be for historical purposes, it can be for archive purposes. And so they ended up at JPL with pallets and pallets and pallets of these Ampex near two inch wide magnetic data tapes. And there is a facility that I believe is still operational up near Mojave Desert out of an old McDonald's plant. Uh, no, it's actually in, in San Jose. Is it San Run Jose? I, you're talking about the Ampex uh, facility in San Jose. The Orbiter facility, yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought it was closer than that. I realized it was San Francisco. No. Okay. I'm in the Bay Area. And, and, you know, she just happened to, the, the, the lady that, that, that made the project come together, she happened to, to save two of the tape drives in her personal garage for, you know, 40 plus years. And the last engineer that knew how to set up the heads to, re to read these drives, you know, shortly before he retired, said, okay, yeah, I'll help you line everything up so you can do the reverb. And then they're playing back these tapes, and they're getting, because the quality that you see on a screen and the quality that you see in the pictures from the day were images taken of a TV screen because they didn't have the ability to digitally transcode video from this format to this format. So they put a TV screen up and they took a video of that TV screen. So what did it do? So how much loss, well just because it wasn't on TSC and they can basically put it on TV. 10 to 30% in the lines. In lines. So what you end up with is, is the data rate that came down from the spacecraft was near film quality. And by looking at those original data tapes, they've been able to pull data that is, is nearly as good as what we can shoot today at the same resolution, the same distance and whatnot. And they're finding that some of the best data was the interstitial shots where, okay, we want this site and this site, but you, because you had to do a frame advance, again, this is all film, now this is digital, developed in orbit around the moon and then scanned and beamed back. They're taking this film, advancing it one frame so that they have a clean frame line between this piece and this piece, and they're giving the flight controllers free reign, go ahead, go ahead and shoot whatever you want because we have to frame advance this one anyway and we're never going to transmit it back. And so that's how you get that stunning earth rise over the moon shot. That's how you get these weird oblique sideways shots that are show incredible texture that, that only now are people looking at, you know, in some cases for the first time, and certainly for the first time at that resolution. Yeah, it was very interesting. Keith Cowling, the man who you might read on NASA Watch or on spacerep.com or NASA Watch.com, um, is the one that's one of the people spearheading this, along with uh, Dennis Wingo and some other people. And you look it up under Lunar Orbiter, um, I can't remember the... the Lunar, Lunar, Lunar Orbiter, Orbiter, there's... there's, there's, there's Techno archaeology. There's yeah. you know three or four, three or four other you know. Keith, Keith and I have kept in contact because of our similar likes of this stuff. He's right. been here, 
And the, it's, it's interesting because we're looking at pictures in a 1967 frame slide or whatever. Then you see the 19 or 2011 picture redone but now, and it's incredibly good. Really? Really? They're tiny women. There's no way. Uh, unfortunately, and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, the one part that we still haven't found any Apollo tapes, but you know, they're yeah, probably they're sure. just trying to race. So it's cool. um, and, and, and even Polaroid shot at the television screens at the time yeah. are just incredible. But, well, so, come on. Moon pies are out there, folks. So if you have questions, really? you can see me out there. If you, Thank you. you know, as I said, this will be more stuff. I'm sure I'll have more to talk about. Thank you so much. I'm going to grab my two volunteers.